comes to school people because when somebody says good morning, they pay attention, unlike people in, in real life. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm Jane Cook. I'm Chief Digital Communications Officer at uh, the, I can never say my own division correctly, the Division of Instructional and Information Technology. Oopsie, I'm running this slide. Allegedly. Space. website inclusion with us. So, we have sign language interpreters here if anybody needs a sign language interpreter. And we also have closed caption up there. So I'm gonna ask a slightly impolitic question. If you have a sign language need, would you kindly come down so that the sign language interpreters know who you are? Uh, the sign language interpreters will also be available immediately after the morning show on the vendor floor. So you may or may not have noticed, because I'm, I'm, I'm not noticing myself, that the vendors all have signs, and you're supposed to be sitting with your vendor team. Is anybody sitting with their, oh, there's a vendor in the back, let me put my glasses on, who is that? I think it's Inchoff. Oh, and there's Google sitting over there. Okay, all the other vendors are asleep on the job. Anyway, so Inchoff, all right, so what I'm gonna do, is I, we want to see, this is like a really unscientific kind of poll, right? So when I call a vendor name, either like do something vertical, like you know, like jump up and down or raise your arms, and everybody should like go woo woo if that is uh, a sound that is available to you, and if that's not a sound available to you, just, you know, whatever sound it is. Okay, does anybody want to move to a place next to a vendor? Yeah. okay. So, I'm gonna call a vendor, WordPress. WordPress, who's a WordPress? Yay, make some noise. Yeah. Blackboard. Yes. Who's got a tambourine back there? That's kind of cool. Uh, e Chalk. Right, E Chalk is winning so far. Uh, Entrada. Excellent, excellent. Google. Nice. Uh, Edlio. Very good. View Sonic. Microsoft. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Very good. Very good. Now, if if you've ever wondered, Thanks. how wait, if you've ever wondered how far someone would go for you, <laughs> Wix came halfway around the world to be here with you today, all the way from Israel. Yeah. Wix. All right. Okay. Now, who is Team Wix? <laughs> I guess this is like everybody is Team Wix today. It's like St. Patrick's Day, right? Uh, and so, I want to say thank you to all of you vendors for uh, coming here and supporting this work. We really could not do this without your cooperation, collaboration, support, partnership, however you want to put it. So, uh, so thank you, and can we please give all the vendors a round of applause. Uh, okay, so uh, there are a few other people I want to thank, obviously. I want to thank Tech and Learning for putting this all together. So for Tech and Learning. Yes. And I want to also thank Principal Jen Ren Quadro, and I hope I didn't massacre that. Thank you, the, the principal of this school, the school again. Thank you very much. And you'll hear from her at the end of the day at the uh, award ceremony, so I hope you'll all stick around for that. And also the school spot, Janet Alliance. <laughs> So now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, 
Corey Fuller. She's the Director of Marketing and Branding at the DOE. And uh, please give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Director of Marketing and Branding at the DOE. Um, I really want to thank DIIT for being here. Thank you for inviting me to be here and Tech and Learning for inviting me to be here. But I especially want to thank all of you for being here. Um, you know, one of the one of my goals as Director of Branding is to look at everything through a brand lens. And a brand is much more than a logo. It's really much more about our who we are and what we stand for, thank you, what we stand for, and it's a promise that we make to our community. And so it's, it's for that reason that I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, one of our recurring messages that we come back to time and again from a brand perspective, and part of the drumbeat that we try to keep going is the idea of equity and excellence. And there are a lot of things um, that, that we mean when we say equity. Equity can take a lot of different forms. Um, but one of the main things that we're talking about is accessibility. And making sure that our students and their families have access to the information that they need, regardless of what language they speak, regardless of what their abilities are. And obviously we have some people at the DOE here who are really leading the charge for us. And they're the great folks who have put this together for us today. But let's face it, we know that the DOE is massive, and this is a job that's bigger than any one team can do on its own. And it's for that reason that I'm really excited for us to be together, because to deliver on our brand promise of providing a high quality education to all of our students, but also really valuing the energy and the commitment and the contributions that their families make, we need to provide information to them in a way that allows them to engage with us. And that's why what we're doing here is so important. Um, I will be around throughout the day. I will be at the vendor table with DIIT, and I'm excited to talk with many of you about um, DOE's brand and visual identity, as well as our marketing efforts and school marketing efforts. Um, and that can include everything from the website, which is such a focus today, as well as purchase collateral, social media, paid advertising, um, and so much more. So I'll just say in closing that our brand is stronger when we are all brand advocates. And likewise, our marketing will be stronger when we're all accessibility advocates. So I'm excited to work with you all, and I thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Tori. And Max. So I want to tell you, so my son Max is a graduate of New York City Public Schools. And uh, he's really the reason I came to work at the DOE. So whenever I get to introduce or encounter or you know just talk to another DOE parent who is fighting the good fight, it just like kind of tickles me pink. So I am tickled pink right now, although I'm not wearing pink. Oops. And I'm, I'm like I'm really bad at this today. Sorry. Um, I want to introduce you to Lori Pavesker. She is the director of disability and education policy at Include NYC. She is also uh, a parent representative on the panel for education policy. So, please welcome Lori. and now lead the education and disability policy work at Include NYC. But the biggest reason why I'm here today is because I'm the mother of Jack. Jack will be 17 years old a week from today and has one of the purest, kindest, and happiest souls I know. Jack is also nonverbal on the autism spectrum and has cerebral palsy. While Jack physiologically is in the throes of the near 17 years of age in many ways, including puberty <laughs> and active hormones, Jack developmentally and intellectually on a good day is like a seven or eight year old. While he is funny, honest, loving, and sweet, he also can sniff out something or someone not nice quicker than any of us. 
And despite being mostly nonverbal, he doesn't stop communicating in his own ways for a second. He also uses assistive technology to communicate and uses an AAC device. Do any of you guys know what that is? Cool. And if any of you have a good picture for us to use that represents God, I'd be really appreciative of that because I don't know how to visually present that. Um, right? I mean, what does that look like? Um, Jack will hug anybody who asks, he'll bust into a dance move in a hot second, yet he also will get into the personal space of others and stare way too long at someone, especially somebody he doesn't understand. Jack also doesn't have the muscular strength in his fingers to button his pants on his own, know when and how to safely cross the street. But most importantly, Jack does not know how to fully read nor write, yet he's six foot three and almost 17 years old. He attends a District 75 high school program on the Lower East Side in a huge co-located building that heavily integrates performing arts into the curriculum. Jack loves his teachers, his classmates, therapists, routines, and going to school each day. And he continues to make slow but steady progress and continues to developmentally exceed milestones <coughs> I never even dreamed were possible. The truth is, is that Jack has only come this far because of all the people in his life, which first and foremost are his amazing teachers and therapists who believe in him and push him to make progress and firmly, yet supportively, hold him accountable and all the other people who work at his school that not only help it run operationally, but just as important, the people whose day-to-day -day actions and words help shape the inclusive culture and community. People just like you. So thank you. And that is why I'm here today and why I'm involved, as well as the primary perspective that I bring to the panel for educational policy. I also remain involved because of our Chancellor, Chancellor Karamba and his ongoing courageous efforts to address the underlying problems and structural patterns within our schools that negatively contribute to the disparities in our public education system, while upholding his commitment of engaging parents and students and families in the process. I fully agree with the Chancellor's view and approach that we, as both the school system and the city, in the need for our students to be educated in more integrated settings and the system as a whole needing for all curriculum and instruction to be way significantly more inclusive. And his belief that this requires huge cultural shifts and policy changes to support it. This starts with each of us looking deep within to examine our individual attitudes and beliefs and culturally leading our system to having higher academic and social expectations for the 1.1 million students. That being said, I'm passionate, passionate about getting people to see and value students like Jack and the near 300,000 other students just like him with IEPs, and that diversity should not only be about class, race, and ethnicity, it should also be about the equitable inclusion of all students and all families, and of all minority groups, including the large minority group of students, families, and citizens in New York City with disabilities in all schools, in all school buildings, in all activities. And this is where you all come in. The power you all have with the language you use, the language you write, the tone in which you say things, the way you visually and linguistically present information, the mindfulness you use when creating and posting content <coughs> for websites, etc. I say this because in the ways that you do that speaks to how you value people with disabilities. Choosing content that engages families, opposed to just posting something because you have to, says you care. Using short sentences and plain languages says you care. Giving people actionable information instead of telling them what not to do says you care too. The wild thing about all this is that it applies to everyone, not just people with disabilities. Inclusion is about all of us. But too often, people with disabilities are excluded. So I ask you all to keep thinking about how people with disabilities will access, process, and receive the information that you provide on your school's website. And ask that you assume that people with disabilities are competent. And recognize that our needs are the same as everyone else's. It's how our needs that are met are special. And not that we have special needs, because our needs are the same as everybody else's. We're all on the same side, and ultimately we all have the same goals for our students and families. 
The only difference amongst us is that we each have different roles and responsibility in fulfilling how these joint goals are met. There is more that connects us than divides us. And we are all more powerful when working together than we are alone. Me standing up here and being seen and heard right now is what democracy and inclusion looks like. Thank you. nothing like uh, hearing it straight from somebody who is affected by the work that we do. So I appreciate you coming here and telling us uh, about you and that Jack. Okay, so now it's time for the really big show. We have our keynote speaker, Lynn Warman. She's the founder and president of Rico Accessibility Services. And whoops. this is Lynn. And this is me doing what I have to do so Lynn can get her presentation. Okay, and now here's the Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody that brought me here from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have to say, I have to share with you, we're a little company of digital technologists who look at disabilities. Our home base is Minneapolis, Minnesota, though we have testers as far as the Philippines and an accessibility specialist that works with us from Long Beach, another one that works with us from Milwaukee, Kansas. And um, they're really excited that I'm here with you because this is a big deal for us to be, to be brought to another city and to be able to speak with educators. As the daughter of a special education teacher and uh, from someone who comes from a family with generations of cognitive disabilities, I am really honored to have a seat at your table. And I'm telling you that you are, the fact that you're here in this room and that you're listening tells us a lot about you. Chances are, somebody in your life lives with a disability. It's getting more and more frequent. We know that the world is becoming a lot more disabled for a lot of different reasons. Aging, just the fact that our, our health is moving in that direction across the world. But also, we're in a world where inclusion matters a lot more. It's no longer normal to assume that excluding somebody is okay just because it's cheaper or it's easier. And the fact that you're in this room today says a lot about how you feel about that. So we really applaud you for being here. My job today is to try to convince you that this is not as hard as it seems. Because it isn't. So just to, to recap, thanks to the people that stopped by the table this morning and met me. It was really fun to talk with you. Um, we're a little tiny company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and where we came from was from my past. Eight years ago, I was assigned to determine how the Minnesota Department of Transportation was going to communicate their work on an Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan. At that time, the DOT was looking at three potential lawsuits for inaccessible infrastructure. I had a communications background. At the time, I was a federal program coordinator, and I happened to know the person who was the brand new ADA transition plan coordinator. She came to me and said, we have no idea how we're going to get this out to the public. We know it has to be accessible. We don't know how to do it, and you figure it out. How many of you have had that brought into your life? I've got a lot of them. Yep. <laughs> and that's where much of accessibility work has begun across the world. So if you're thinking, this is something that I can't do because I don't know how to do it, trust me, if I can figure it out, you can figure it out. So what I noticed is that during that effort, I was watching a group of advisory board members who live with disabilities. Some of them were involved in the advocacy that was potentially going to sue the state, so they were there to try to help 
did things beyond that. And I watched them interface with my coworkers who didn't live with disabilities and were trying to understand them. And I saw how powerful it was to bring people who live with disabilities together with people who were trying to help stakeholders and taxpayers. So out of that idea, WECO Accessibility Services was born, and some of those advisory board members are on our advisory board. We are unique in that we are a mission-based for-profit because everyone that works at WECO lives with a disability if they work on technology. And we really feel that our skills are viable in the for-profit workplace. So who do we work for? Just to give you a little bit of reference, we work for big companies like 3M. They're in our backyard. We work in legal. We work for companies like Perkins Coie and Dorsey Whitney. We always work on behalf of people that are trying to make their, their websites better. And we work in education. We have worked on software. We've worked on very tiny public school websites. There's one in Texas we worked on a few years ago. And we work with organizations like the Texas Education Association. So why I'm telling you that is because I want you to know that accessibility can be scaled up and it can be scaled up. It is possible for anyone and it is possible for you. So today's takeaway, and we say this a lot, we go, accessibility is a skill you can learn. It is a skill that your staff can learn. And I'm like chewing down here and trying to run this presentation and flip my slides. So this always makes me think about accessibility when I do the moment things at once. Because I know people who do this every day, the speech recognition software and trying to run a little roller ball mouse. So it's good practice. But overall, what I want you to think about is the fact that this is not rocket science. And once you start learning accessibility, you're gonna say, why is WECO making so much money training us? I could have just figured this out myself. I mean, there are, in, in some, some ways, it isn't that hard. It's just that most people don't have the time to research it, and we do. And we package it together for you. It is a process you apply. It is not a, a, a switch that you flip. Okay. It is, and I always remember this when I was a first getting into accessibility at MnDOT. We were about to release the Complete Streets Legislative Study. An engineer came up to my desk and said, "We're going to release this legislative study tomorrow. Could you section 508 it?" Like I was going to wave a magic wand over it. And it took me eight weeks to make that document accessible because it was layers and layers and layers of things that have been done to it that were inaccessible, multiple authors. Um, I actually was ready to throw myself off the Capitol Dome by the end of it, but I learned what inaccessibility and accessibility was through that exercise. But it's really important for you to understand that the way we do accessibility now is a series of steps. Okay? There may be a day when there is software that can just do it for you, but we're not quite there yet. There is software that can do some of it for you, but what our testers who deal with disabilities have found that it's not full for you. And it works when it is baked into what you do every day. If you wait until the end of the process, add accessibility on, it is a lot more expensive, and it is a lot more work. Um, how many of you sew? Does anybody sew anymore? Okay, a few people. Okay. My mother was a master seamstress. She, I used to perform out at the Minnesota Renaissance Festival on the singer, and she made my gown. She was really good. And the one thing that I learned about that is that once you put something, a garment together, if you figure out you did something wrong and you have to rip it apart, it's a lot more work. So let's say you're making a garment and you put, the, you put the sleeves on backwards. You have to rip apart each little seam, each little thread to get that sleeve off and get it back on. Accessibility is just like that. 
So do it as a part of your daily process, your daily check. If you were out at my table, there was a checklist that was laminated. Those are the basic things. It's great to keep that up in your queue so that as you're making changes to a website, as you're building a document, you can remember the basic things. And accessibility, like education, is an opportunity. It has a real power to be able to improve people's lives, to educate, as you know, but also to include people who were previously excluded. I love this picture. This is of one of our lead testers, Maureen Franghofer. And Maureen is an amazing human being. She's blind. She is also in a wheelchair. And she and her husband maintain a home in a fabulous garden. And Maureen's husband has no arms and one leg, and he is the gardener. And every time I go over to their house, it is an attitude adjustment. But they're, they're an amazing couple, and Maureen is wonderful at conveying her experience of what it is like to live with blindness, what she needs for accessibility to a lot of our clients. This is her with Emma, a curator at the Bell Museum at the University of Minnesota, brand new museum. And she's conveying to her what she is sensing in the skull that she's taking a look at. And what's exciting is that we're starting to work with museums and talk about what it's like to improve the experience for people who can't see the displays, that they can't sense them in the same way. So realize that you are about to embark upon something that is much more than a legal requirement. It's a wonderful mission of opportunity. So how did I get here? Probably the same way you did in a lot of ways. Uh, this is a picture of me with my daughter Olivia, who is now 28, married and living in Chicago. But this is a favorite picture of mine because it was taken at the 2017 Minnesota Statewide Bus Rodeo. So my first job when I came to MnDOT was called the RTAP Coordinator of World Transit Assistance Program. And it is still one of the jobs I love the most, what I did. I ran an education program for the states bus drivers, rural transit bus drivers. At that point in time, Minnesota had one of the most comprehensive rural transit programs in the United States. We had 80 small town bus organizations. And my job was to coordinate the training for the bus drivers so that they could work with vulnerable adults and children. They could secure wheelchairs and buses. And I came into that program more as somebody that was a project manager with good communication skills. I constructed training, I constructed a maltreatment awareness training that's still used in some states. And the fun thing I got to do every year was recognize the skill of bus drivers in a bus road. Field. And these people can do things with large city buses that you wouldn't do with your car. And it's amazing. So it was, at that point in time, and I'm heading down this path of somewhat working with disability, but more working just in education, when my department came to me and said, we've had budget cuts, we've got nobody to keep up the website, we need, we need somebody to do that. You've got good writing skills, can we send you to school? So I found myself in school for that. Then I found myself coordinating a huge website called Wellness on the Web for the state of Minnesota Department of Transportation employees because no one was doing that. And then I found myself in the ADA transition plan trying to figure this out. So for many of, of us, this is how it starts. And I think it's really important for you to note that it is very common among people who work in my industry as well. So, hang on a minute. What I learned along the way is that I met with the members of MnDOT's ADA Transition Plan Advisory Board because I had no clue 
how to build an accessible website. I didn't even know at that point in time what a screen reader was. I just walked up to the members of the advisory board and said, can I come into your house and watch you use our website so that I know how to build your web pages? And at first I think they thought I was crazy, but they let me do it. <laughs> so we became friends and probably the most moving part of that was asking uh, Joe Tolliver, who became a friend of mine, who was blind, had been blind from birth, how the web, web had changed things for her and her ability to access it. She said the entire world opened up for me when I was able to use a screen reader. So ask yourself, what is it like? What is it like if you could read bus schedule? What would it be like if you couldn't do an online bank transaction? I mean, I would have no money because if I wasn't online, I wouldn't have what I have. I'd spend myself down. What would you do if you couldn't communicate with family and friends? So take a look at that and know that that's the power that you hold. You're going to be able to give people more independence, to make it Give them the possibility of applying for it, doing work online, being educated. And the other things that I noticed is that among the friends I made on that board, that they were extremely intelligent people. A lot of times they just went to school forever because they could not get jobs. And they were bored. They were not stimulated. And being able to be on the web gave them so much more opportunity. So as educators, it is so important what you're doing, and it's also something that can be quite magical. This is another picture of one of our senior testers, Chad Cook, and Chad has very limited fine motor skills. He is in a wheelchair. Um, he was in a car accident summer after a senior year of high school, and he said his life totally changed at that point. But Chad has been with us since 2012, and he does accounting work, he's trained as an accountant, and I will never forget the day that he was at our office, and I was opening the door for him to leave, and I said, thanks for coming in today, Chad, and he said, no, thank you. I've been sitting at home watching television for years, and it's these stories that I've gotten from the people that work with us and for us that I've begun to realize just how big the world became when they were able to get on the web. And this is part of what our staff does. This is at World Usability Day at the University of Minnesota last year, and Chad is explaining how speech recognition software works and how to develop for it. So the other question that I get is, all we have to worry about is screen readers, right? because it's really about people that have low vision or no vision. And when I started to work on accessibility, this is the road that I took. I was very fortunate to have a mentor named Janet Peters from the Great Lakes ADA Center, who was constantly saying to me, you've got to look at the complete picture. There are people that live with all different types of disabilities. So the pushback we get a lot at WECO from particularly creative firms that are trying to build websites for clients and they're trying to keep the cost down is that we really only need to look at blindness because everything else is easy or is a small fix or is a very small part of the population. So just for you today, I decided to pull together these statistics taken from the 2012 census that currently in the United States, 19.9 million people live with mobility disabilities, not all impact computer use, but many do. 15.2 million live with cognitive disabilities, and that can be a wide range. I live with a cognitive disability that is lifelong depression and mental illness. I have sisters in my family who live with epilepsy. It can encompass deficit disorder, learning disabilities. 8.1 million live with blindness and 7.6 live with hearing related disabilities. So really it is important to include them all. 
We're going to take a really quick look, closer look at the different disabilities people live with and how they impact computer use. And from talking with some of you this morning, I realized that you're just starting down this road. So this will get you up to speed pretty fast as to why you need to include everyone in your accessibility efforts. So again, this is a picture of Chad. And Chad is using a Microsoft Surface tablet with a stylus, which is what he does when he works in our office. So for him, because he can move his arms some, but he doesn't really have any motion in his hands, Clicking and scrolling can make him very, very tired. So I know a lot of developers say, I want a clickable site, and I just, I just cringe when I hear that because it's, you know, if, 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 it, if you have to click a lot and, and it's difficult to use your hands, that can make it very impossible to access. It can be difficult for him to, to select like small links that are grouped together, like on the side of a page, like quick links. You need to make sure there are enough spacing. And the big thing is that forms that are long and intricate can take time to complete. So if they're on a timer, bank forms, airline reservation forms, they can be very, very frustrating. And for someone with limited fine motor skills, if you've completed one form that times out, you have to start over again, chances are you may not have the energy to do it yet. So when you live with cognitive challenges, this is probably the hardest group to get a handle on because the range is so big of people who have different cognitive disabilities. This picture is of one of our former testers, Chelsea, and we learned a lot about Chelsea when she worked with us because she was a young, younger tester for us at that time. And she lives with an intellectual disability. And she was absolutely addicted to her iPhone. Her dream was to work in the iPhone store uh, and to be a Disney princess. So, <laughs> but what we learned from Chelsea is that she had no desire to own a desktop. She had her iPhone, she had her tablet. And I really tried to dig into, you know, why is she, is it just because it's hip? Is it because it's affordable? But what we learned is that the simplified mobile layout was just way easier for her to navigate, and that's why she pre preferred it. Because too much old information can overwhelm her. Information that isn't organized can, can be impossible to find, and things like moving graphics could really distract her. But it, these are really simplifications, guys. There's a lot more to it than that. Just, just gives you an idea. So let's take a closer look when you can't hear well or you can't hear at all. This is one of our testers, Kate. Kate lives with a hearing disability that uh, was inherited through her family. She could hear some conversation. She could hear music very well, but there are a lot of things that she could not pick up, particularly in room with it where there's a lot of people talking. For her, um, videos without captions feel very exclusionary. Uh, webinars that don't have live captioning, and just the secret live captioning is, is obviously not that tough to do anymore. We have a live captioner that captions all of our webinars in paraphrase, and it, it's not very expensive. The company we work with is great. So, you know, realize that that is something that is not that hard to do anymore. So think about if sound equates access, that that can be really prohibitive for people. And one thing that Kate often says to me is that she said, you know, people think I don't understand them, but I don't hear them, and there is a difference. So it's really easy, I think, sometimes to overlook the needs of people that cannot hear well or hear deaf because we think, well, they can see it, you know, that should be easy, or, you know, it, it, it's just, it's one of the disabilities that I see a lot of our clients skip over, and I think it's a really important one. So, of course, let's talk about blindness and low vision, because this is the one I think that most people get afraid of. 
if they don't know somebody who's blind or low vision and they don't understand it. So just to give you a quick overview, is that people who use screen reader software depend upon something we call navigation points. And those are properly coded things like headings, properly coded bullet points, number lists. Because when you take a look at a page, and let's say, you know you're looking for directions to the shopping mall, and you're on the, the mall website. You're just going to skim that page until you see the header that says how to find us or location, right? Well, if you're blind, you're only seeing one word at a time. And so if a page has headings marked on it properly, they, a person with a screen reader can command it to read the headings out. But if the headings aren't marked properly, it will simply say to them, there are no headings on this page. And they have to read every single word to get to the bottom. Okay? So that's why it's really important to make it easier. I mean, can you imagine having to read a web page as if you're looking through a soda straw and having to read every single word to get to the information you need on the bottom? It's also important to have alternative text on all your images, which just simply describes what it is. People need equal access to that information. And I do run into people that think, I'm just going to mark every image as decorative. But people miss out. They want to know what everybody else is experiencing. Improperly coded forms was something I did all the time at the state because I know just enough code to make myself dangerous. Um, so it's other people on our team that are the code experts. But what often happens when you repurpose forms is that you will repurpose the fields in the front but not adjust them in the code. And that can really lead people astray when they're trying to complete forms. And for people who are low vision, color contrast is real important. So if you stop by our table and got one of your free our free accessibility library cards, we have links to all sorts of checkers that, that are free that check color contrast. So just to kind of wrap this up, to us at WECO, accessibility and usability are really the same thing. Now technically that's called universal design, but we find that websites that are accessible make everybody much happier because it's easier to find things, it's smoother when you transition through pages, there are less distractions, and the form completion becomes seamless. And other perks that I hear from people who do not identify with a disability is that intuitive design just makes it easier to find things. And a growing number of people my age really, really like video captions. Why? Because there is a phenomenon of people moving into the baby boom, from the baby boom generation, into retirement age that are losing their hearing and don't want to talk about the fact they're losing their hearing. They don't want to deal with it. So I, we're finding that a lot of older people that don't identify as having hearing-related disabilities really appreciate having captions. But search engine rewards accessibility. It is a big part of how SEO works now. Things like headings that are marked, alternative text tags, all of those things are rewarded through SEO. So the last thing that I was asked to cover with you is how do I know when to fix a website and when to start over? So before I came here, I consulted Swan Rodriguez, our Director of Accessibility Services, very talented woman who is blind and develops with a screen reader. And I said, okay, Sue Ann, how, what do I tell people? You know, what do we know? And she said, it is so hard to say because it really depends upon the website and the access to accessibility knowledge that the people that build it and the people that are working on it have. And she gave me an example of a recent client that had a database built for them. And this is a organization that serves people who live with disabilities that have people with disabilities working for them. 
and they were so, and we've worked with them for years, and they were so excited, they came to us and they said, we're getting this database built, and the developer really understands accessibility, so you're gonna be able to just walk in and audit it, and come back out and give us, you know, the seal of approval. And, you know, when, when people say that to us, we're, we're, always, we're always scared. So, um, what, what happened was that the developer gave himself a very basic, read up on accessibility and for any of you that have done any accessibility work you'll know you'll know what I'm talking about. But he essentially applied ARIA tags to absolutely everything and our screen readers could do it. So sometimes knowing when to start over and knowing what you, you need to fix has to be a process and sometimes you have to bring in somebody who does it all the time and somebody that you can trust. And if you, if you want more information on that, if you ever want to talk to us or talk to me about how do I vet you know, somebody who's building a website for me, we help people try to figure that out all the time. So the basics that, that I know that we see what you can fix is, do you have formally marked headings on your site? You can add those easily. Do you have alternative text tags? You can add those easily. Do you have, for instance, a carousel with pictures that moves? Are there controls on that carousel? You can mark those so non-visual users can start to stop those. That's possible. If you have too much content, and I know in government what we used to do is we used to use the website as the filing cabinet for all the newsletters we wrote, right? Well, that's, that's too much information for some people. So you can manage that content. And if you have control over your cascading style sheet, it really helps. When it's time to start over, what we've witnessed, and this is not necessarily true for everybody, but if there are lots and lots of customized features, it gets really difficult to make those accessible if they weren't built accessibly in the first place. And if you have limited, uh, access to, if somebody else vends your CMS um, and you can't get into it to apply accessibility features, that can get really hard. So we are a mission-based, we are for-profit, but we are mission-based, so we do have free resources. Go to our website, the WECO, T-H-E-W-E-C-O, just WECO was taken, so we had to throw it in front of it. But WECO.com, under the resources tab, we have a free accessibility library. Some of you already made requests with me for a free assessment. We're happy to do that. You can also sign up for that right on the front page of our website. And we also have an educational blog of quick tips to help you. So what I'd like to impress upon you is that we're really here to help, and that you can do it. And you've got, you've got a lot of why behind you. I hope that today inspires you to know that this is possible for you and, and um, you've got resources to help. So thank you so much for having me with you today. National Federation of the Blind, and my favorite comment from the National Federation of the Blind after they had folks uh, user test our prototype was, it's the best sounding website I've ever heard. So that was that was really pretty remarkable. And I'm um, happy to discuss anything else you'd like to talk about with the website, but anyway, okay. We're clearly having technical difficulties. No, we're here to retrograde right now. So it was probably a mistake to rely on, on technology, so I'm just going to wait this. 
Um, so you're wondering what comes next, right? So next comes the showcase, and if you could see it, there would be the um, all of the logos for all the wonderful vendors that we're going to have here. And then um, I want to let you know about your uh, CTLE credits, which you'll get at the awards show at the end of the day, right? Okay. And then I hope that you'll uh, join us for Spock Tales which is uh, from 3.30 to 5 at the Stumble Inn, which I passed on the way here. It's on 76th Street and 2nd Avenue. You can't miss it. It's on the corner. It's got a very big sign. All right. Who cares about this? Um, without further ado, we'll start the, uh, the, vendor the Vendor Showcase. And thanks again so much for coming. And thank you for the work you do. Give yourself a hand. So while Clay is getting us reconnected, um, if you can just click here so you can see, I think we're doing this in alphabetical order, which means Blackboard, if you can click there, yep. Okay, good. Um, I think you need to turn it on there. Okay, um, so the way this is going to work is that basically this is a showcase showdown. And you are going to hear from, we invited all of the website platform vendors here to New York City and that said that they would support us with accessibility. So you will hear from each of them. And then you have a document um, that we gave you the URL for and maybe play, you could pop that URL up and put it on the spot one more time. On that URL, if you can get connected, if not, just uh, we'll get it connected in a second. You will see a tab in the spreadsheet that says Participant Reflections. All of your names, if you pre-registered, are on that spreadsheet in alphabetical order. And if you did not pre-register, you can just add your name at the end. And as you hear from each vendor, kind of share what you think. We'll give you a time to turn and talk and process and then share what you think. And we'll also put that URL up at the time that you'll be doing it. So can we first get Blackboard? Are we ready for Blackboard? 